we have a masonry shear wall today with actual design loads, with actual properties of our wall. And let's determine how much deflection we have of our shear wall. See you in there. We have our figure, which we all know and love, 15 foot tall, uh, reinforced solid masonry wall. The wall thickness is eight inches. The length of the wall is 18 feet. We have a, uh, a shear demand of 70 kips applied at the top of the wall laterally in plane with our wall. This is an in plane analysis. How much does this wall displace? Our block uh, F prime M, our compressive strength of our block is denoted at 2,500 PSI. Um, we are denoting this as CMU. A quick little tangent here, CMU is concrete masonry units. Um, there is a difference in masonry uh, and properties with which we design with in the TMS between concrete masonry units, CMU, and brick masonry units. Uh, they're not called BMU. And they have different strengths, they have different properties, and thus they you have to design differently with both of them. So something earlier on in my career, I thought all masonry construction was just called CMU. So I thought CMU meant it applied to everything. But CMU is a particular type of masonry. So as I've gotten older, when I talk about CMU construction, I don't say that anymore. I say, oh, I'm working on um, a project with masonry construction in it because masonry is all encompassing, whether it's concrete, whether it's brick, whether it's um, and anything in between. All right, what else have we got here? Well, we need our modulus of elasticity of our uh, masonry brick. That is denoted with an equation of 900 F prime M. Again, this equation depends on the type of block that we are using. So CMU, it's 900 F prime M, it, and it's just a function of your block compressive strength. So plug that in and convert to KSI. That gets us 2250. Next, we need our modulus of rigidity, or I've also seen it called our shear modulus. And this is known with an equation as well, 0 0.4 E prime M. So this equation is dependent upon your modulus of elasticity of your brick. We plug that in and we convert to KSI. 900 KSI is our shear modulus. These two equations are found in the TMS section 4.2.2. To keep it a little more brief today, because it's kind of late and I already recorded this entire 30 minutes worth of recording and my screen was blank and didn't realize it, but that's not your problem, that's my problem. Uh, I'm not gonna flip over to the actual TMS on screen. So you're just gonna have to trust me. And if you don't trust me, go check out the thing that I just wrote right freaking here. Another real world thing that I wanna talk about quickly is the demand over here. This 70 kips, uh, when we're doing something like finding story drift, so your redundancy factor, if you're not familiar with that, uh, in seismic applications can either be 1.0 or 1.3, depending on the system and a bunch of checks that you have to do in order to determine which one you get to use. But that row is applied, actually multiplied by your uh, story force. So a row of 1.0 versus 1.3 can make a very big difference. But when you're checking drift, even if your design calls for a row of 1.3, drift checks are always using a row of 1.0. So if you do have a design of 1.3, then when you do your drift checks for that design, you get to strip out or divide out the 1.3 from your story shear. Secondly, this story force of 70 kips is a strength level load, even if you were doing an analysis in ASD. Yes, that's right. Um, per the ASCE section 12.8.6, it denotes that story drift needs to be determined based on strength level loads, even if you're doing ASD analysis. And so what that would mean is keep all things seismic here. If we were designing for ASD, where the load combo would be 0.7 E sub H, when you're doing your drift check, you would need to uh, divide out the 0.7 from your force and jack up your forces to get them to strength level of 1.0 uh, E. We are going to assume today that the 70 kips already went through that process. It's already strength level and it's a row of 1.0 and we're good to go. But those are real things that need to be considered when you're doing your engineering in the real world, okay? All right, the next thing we need is the cross-sectional area of our wall. 
So remember over here, cross-sectional area looks something like that. With a thickness, we have an eight inch solid masonry wall. That is not truly eight inches with masonry. It's actually an eight inch is 7.625 inches. Why that is, I actually don't know. I'd have to go look at the history of why that is, but it's the same thing for every type of block. If you go 12 inch block, it's 11.625. If you go four inch block, I think it's 3.625, blah, blah, blah. But double check me on that. I don't know why that is, but you cannot just say, oh, it's an eight inch block. I'm gonna be lazy get my big head out of the way and use eight inches. That would be overly conservative. Uh, sorry, that would be under conservative for an engineer and it is the incorrect way to go about your analysis. So you have to be that precise. I've seen it go to people use 7.63 a lot of times. I use 7.625, that's me. Um, the wall is 18 feet long. We're gonna convert that to inches. It's 216 inches. Area is just boom, those two uh, multiplied together. And we need our moment of inertia, gross. And we know that we're taking it about this axis because it's about how the force is kind of rotating over um, our geometry. That's at least how I think about it. So moment's gonna kind of rotate about an in a hypothetical pin in the middle of this wall and that wall is gonna spin on the page like that. We remember that for a rectangle, I equals B D cubed over 12. That means that because of the analogy I just gave, B is the thickness and D is the length. A very big number, I'm gonna throw some parentheses in there. 6,403,536 inches to the fourth. Our displacement equation is as follows. Um, if you're unfamiliar with this equation, pause the video, go back to my previous videos, shameless plug to look at more of my videos, uh, where we went way more into depth about what this equation is, what it's derived of, what it means. Um, so if you're a little lost on that, go check it out. But we all know that this is for, this particular equation is for a cantilevered wall, which we have here today. The other quick thing I wanna talk about, the equation is split up into two pieces. We'll call it piece one and piece two. Piece one is the amount of displacement due to flexural uh, deformation. And piece number two is the amount of displacement due to uh, shear deformation. It is two different modes of movement of the wall that are observed of uh, masonry shear walls or a concrete shear wall. And they are additive to one another to get you your total amount of displacement of your wall. Section one, we plug everything in, it looks like this. All of that spits out 0 0.0095 inches. Not a lot of movement. Uh, section two, plug everything in. All that spits out 0 0.01 uh, inches. If we add these two together, that'll get our, get our total displacement of our wall, which is what we're looking for here today. You don't have to use the summation sign. It's These are both part of the same equation, so really it just gets you displacement delta, but I'm just doing that for the sake of this video. Those two added up gets you 0 0.0196 inches. If we take this number and we divide it by our sum, that'll get us the percent contribution of displacement due to flexural deformation. That comes out to be 48%. And then if we take this number and we divide it by our sum, that will get our percent contribution from a percent contribution of displacement due to shear deformation, which is 52%. If you're running this, these always need to equal 100%. Otherwise you fat fingered something and did something slightly wrong. What does that exactly mean on a high level? Uh, well, intuition says that that to me looks correct because the aspect ratio of this wall is basically square. Um, if we, from previous videos, our magic ratio number, H over L, if we plug that in, that's 15 over 18, which gets you 0 0.833 repeating. That ratio is very close to 1.0. And if we remember from previous videos where we ran some experiments here to kind of test these, these things out, when your wall ratio H over L is close to 1.0, the contributions of flexural and shear deformation are gonna be relatively split down the middle 50-50. So that, that checks out. That gives the green light to say, I think 
think we're on track here. We're doing it right. Even if it's our first time doing it, we're feeling confident. So that's good. We're technically, we found the total displacement of our wall. So video over, right? Well, not exactly. We've come this far. What's some other important information that we can just grab very quickly since we've already run these calculations that we're gonna need most likely uh, for the next steps of designing our, our building. Well, that would be the stiffness of the wall. Mechanics of materials, stiffness K is equal to force over displacement. Simply put, that's not specific to shear walls, that's just in general. We have displacement, we just found it, but we have force, we do. It's the 70 kips that we used at the very beginning. So don't have to find that. We already have both these things. So that means we can just plug in and get our stiffness. Gets us 3,563 kips per inch. Well, that means it's gonna take 3,563 kips pushing on our wall in order for that wall to displace one inch. And that makes sense because there's already 70 kips pushing on this thing and it only got us this small value right here. So we have a pretty freaking stiff wall here. And last thing, something that I didn't touch on too much here, but I think I'm gonna go over in the next video is I assumed a gross moment of inertia. This from my understanding assumes that our wall while under load does not crack, which means that our reinforcing in our wall does not engage which isn't necessarily a great thing uh, because that means we don't really have a ductile system. And where this can impact you greatly is if you get to use the gross air, uh, moment of inertia, it's a very big number. But if you are expecting your wall to crack while under this event level loading, that means you no longer get to use your gross moment of inertia and you get to use some, some eye cracked or eye effective and that's gonna be a much smaller number, which is going to affect your numbers because that means a cracked wall is a less stiff wall. So it'll affect all of these things. Let me know in the comments down below if you think that is a subject you wanna get into. You know, I'm just gonna, I'm gonna vote right now, me, myself, and I, I'm, I'm gonna be doing a video on that. So hey, keep your eyes peeled for it, but let me know in the comments if you just wanna say hi, okay? Say hi, peace.